what an extraordinarily emotional film that is and how hard it is to even think of doing this interview after it when all you want to do is just go into a room and think quietly about it. But it is my great, great honor now to in, uh, introduce this extraordinary panel. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the incredibly talented director, Peter Berg, sitting at the end. One of the stars, the great talent, Taylor Kitsch, who played the great Mike Murphy. Yeah. Well, and of course, the man who lived through this harrowing event, who is the lone survivor himself, the man that we have come here really to honor, Marcus Luttrell. mention that we have in our audience a great number of Navy SEALs. Marcus was actually sitting with many teammates in the audience and we also have with us Admiral Eric Olson who was head of special ops at the time. He is with us tonight too. Well I have to start with Marcus because our heads are so full of questions and so many questions. First of all, Marcus, I mean, uh, just the physical question first. We see what you went through in this unbelievable harrowing ordeal, which is just unthinkable. We see you rolling down that mountain, smashing into rocks. We see you shot up, banged it up in the most unbelievable way. How did you sustain, how did you go through living with that kind of pain, keeping yourself together? How did you even raise a gun? Tell us about the physical ordeal and what, what injuries you did in fact suffer. Um, well, I was shot, uh, had multiple frag, not only from the, the RPG rounds themselves, but from the trees and the, and, and the rocks, which actually hurt worse than the, uh, the RPG blasts themselves. I uh, fractured my spine in multiple places, my pelvis, uh, tore my rotator cuff out. I had, uh, my maximal facial damage was very severe. I didn't show it in the movie, but I'd actually uh, broken my nose and I, I bit my tongue in half and swallowed it. And, um, uh, so I had 11 through and throughs in my quads and calves, most of the uh, skin off of my back side and, and most of my front side was um, turned into hamburger. But as far as the pain tolerance, and uh, most seals have high pain thresholds anyways, and the adrenaline that was flowing through me, I'm concentrating more on what I had to deal with, the task that was in front of me, and, and concentrating on my teammates is, is ultimately what got, uh, got me through the in, initial gunfight. Uh, I was actually shot in the back the following day. It didn't show that. And, uh, that one hurt because uh, my adrenaline wasn't up and I wasn't really prepared for it. Uh, but ultimately, from the time we were we check into SEAL training and become tadpoles and, and work our way up through the community, it's, it's a selection process that, that weeds out the, the, the weak or the ones that can't handle it and the ones that can are the one that, ones that make it through it. And they put us in situations uh, in our training that pretty much equate to everything that, had, that transpired up on the mountain that day. Wow. How long did it take you to actually recover from those wounds? I, I still have surgeries to this very day. Mm -hmm. Wow. So that's unbelievable. Well, of course, the other many questions that we have, and I just want to ask a couple of them because I know you're all going to want to know in the audience, what happened to those communications? I mean, why did those communications go down like that? Why didn't they function that day? My uh, communications are kind of just like cell phones out here. You're driving down the road or talking to somebody, and then all of a sudden the phone just goes down. You don't, you can't explain why. It just just happens. The terrain that we were in, uh, believe it or not, there's a lot that goes into to dealing with communications from the rotation of the earth, the sun, the clouds, and uh, rain. And ultimately, the the position that we were in on to where we could get the best vantage point at our, for our target location and didn't allow us to have uh, stable communications. That's why we had the backup with the, uh, the satellite phone. Well, I mean, what the, why, did the, why were the Apaches not there to, to, to cover? I'm not advised. You're not advised? 
has there been an investigation after I'm not the mission as to what happened? Meaning I'm not going to tell you. You're not going to tell me, okay. <laughs> All right, well, Peter, the Berg, the intense realism of this film makes it very hard to watch at times. Uh, what was your, uh, you know, how did, how did you go about making this film? I mean, I know this was a, a great odyssey for you to get it done. Tell us a little bit about the odyssey to get it done and what you, what you saw in this film that you wanted to do and how you, you wrote it, you directed it. This has been a huge passion of yours for many years. Um, that's a, I don't know where to start with that. I, uh, I was made aware of this book um, when I was working on another movie and I wasn't really open to reading anything or thinking about much. And uh, my partner, Sarah Aubrey, who's here somewhere, was like, no, you, you actually have to sit down and read this book. And I fought her and I argued and she's like, you really have to read it. And uh, during my lunch break, I went back myself in my trailer and was gonna read a few pages of it and tore through the book very quickly. Um, and stood in line with a bunch of other filmmakers uh, to, to try and talk Marcus into letting, letting me take a shot at it. Um, and I got my, my day in court with him and we spent some time together and uh, he, he told me that, you know, the good news was that I, I had, I was gonna give it to me and uh, the bad news was that he would kill me um, and uh, if I screwed it up. <laughs> and uh, he wasn't kidding, I don't think. <laughs> and, uh, and that's been sort of the mantra that I've heard from so many of the team guys, is, you know, we better get it right. And um, somewhere out here is uh, Eric Olson, who had, uh, at the time was uh, uh, running sp special ops in Florida. And I had to go see him and, and kind of plead my case as to why I should I be allowed to have access to the SEAL community, which is generally not uh, particularly receptive to outsiders. Um, we had a, a long conversation about it, and, and he agreed uh, to, to let me have access uh, on a limited basis. And uh, over, over time, there's uh, Admiral Tom Browns here, here somewhere, I think, uh, who was kind of running the show then. He agreed to let me have more access. Um, and that began you know, my journey and, and my passion for, for Marcus and his teammates. Um. Obviously, uh, Mike Murphy is, is one of the great characters in the film, Taylor. Uh, tell us about how you built the character of Mike Murphy. Did you, did you immerse yourself in his family, his friends? How did you learn how to be Mike Murphy? Um, can you hear, you can hear me good? All right. Yeah, I'll hold it. Um, how did I, obviously reading the book, and I had talked a few times, and then I had talked to uh, Pete a, a bunch about it, a lot, lot of meetings with him and I, I'm very, I'm flattering myself but I like to think that I have a, um, some pieces of, of what Mike had as well and it's, it's really bringing the best out of me in, in those attributes that I have and really trying to bring them to the surface as well as talking to Marcus. A lot of the tools that we gained were in the training and, and working with each other and the other SEALs that were training us. Um, that really I think solidified a lot of the choices that I had done on my own, the training in, in Texas where I live. So um, it was, I guess, community. How, how long did you train with the SEALs to, to, to immerse yourself oh, in that man. culture? Um, over a month. And then it was a lot of talking to Marcus, one-on-one -on -one meetings um, in a hotel room before, and then Pete, and then, you know, you have your, your script as well, you know, where you can, you know, create those waves. Marcus, of course, you know, the whole moral pivot of this story is, uh, and, the, and the, you know, the huge turning point is a decision not to kill uh, uh, those uh, shepherds on the mountain. Tell me about that real incident, and do you regret not killing them? No, I, I don't have any regrets at all with anything that I've ever done. It was a situation that we got put in that we, Obviously, we had to deal with. We tried to radio back for um, advice on on how to deal with this particular threat. The our, our target that we were dealing with had, was uh, very elusive. It'd been uh, we've been going after him for about two years before they finally slid him across our desk. And soft compromises are are a part of of what we do sometimes. I mean, working out in that area, it's it's bound to happen. It's their backyard, and we're just kind of 
trying to work our way through it. I mean, it's literally one of the things where if you go in and you take a rock and you move it from this area to this area, it's probably the rock that this guy's great, 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 great grandfather sat on to go to the bathroom or something. And, and it's just like, hey, where's my rock? Obviously, there's, some, there's been somebody up here who's not supposed to be up here. So in order to dig in and find positions to where we can get vantage points on what we were dealing with is, was very difficult. Um, and that's what came in with the training and, and how long we'd been out there. We, we've been doing this, our team had been together for a very, very long time, so we were really good at what we did. The, the overall decision to turn them loose was, was well above our um, pay grade. Um, I'm speaking of rules of engagement and, and stuff like that. And there had been situations in the past where the exact same scenario had played out with uh, other forces, some Green Berets and, and, and so forth and so on. Um, you know, there's no, there's no manual that they can hand us that, that we wish we could look at every time something like that goes down. It's, and it's another thing, it's, and the reason that we train so hard and train so long and that there's so much time and money invested into what we do is because you allow us the the opportunity to make our own decisions while we're out there. I mean, we, it's, it'd be like laying on the operating table while some guy's working on your heart and you're, and you're like, hold on, wait a minute, let's call somebody else in here because I don't think you know what you're doing. Well, we do know what we're doing. So everything that we uh, encountered out there and, and, and all the situations that were right there in front of us, ultimately our decision is what we had to deal with and to turn them loose. Uh, good, bad, or indifferent. The outcome obviously was was bad, but we're we're prepared for that as well. So, Peter, obviously writing that scene must have been for you. A, 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 I'm sure you saw it as a, as a huge turning point in the film. Tell me about writing that scene. Um, How did you get to it? It was a major. No, I mean, you know the, that that moment it was was a was a key moment for me and something that really caught my attention. And and I think what. You know, personally, for me, and, and inspired me about that was kind of stepping out of my life and trying to imagine, uh, you know, what what we ask of these guys. You know, they're all, all in their mid to late twenties, um, and you know, I, I think about what I was doing in, in my mid to late twenties, and uh, it, it wasn't being up on top of a mountain, having been uh, discovered by some. You know, people who may or may not want you uh, to die, uh, and not having any situational awareness, not having communications, uh, not having uh, anyone but yourselves to rely on, um, and that that seemed to me uh, uh, re really typified what we're asking uh, our soldiers to do today, and and um, how much temperament they must show and restraint, and uh, the ability to see macro and micro at the same time. And um, I was just very, very impressed with that. And that that scene, uh, you know, I, I think is probably played out. Um, you know, certainly has been in Iraq and Afghanistan over and over again, and stories that we will never hear about, where young, young men are asked to make extremely uh, complicated uh, and, and morally ambiguous decisions. Uh, and, and so, you know. Except that the audience, in a way, is, is wanting America to do the right thing. I mean, in a way, it, it's also a self defining national sense that, that, you know, we are supposed to do the right things. And you know, yet, yet you know what the right thing is? Well, the right thing, you know, was obviously killing innocent civilians. I don't have any idea. Well. I mean, one, not to be rude or anything like that, but one, one person's, what they think the right idea is, is completely opposite from what the other one is. That's why we have to solely focus on our leadership, our admirals, who have been around and have been through all of this, and they, they, they make the calls, and it flows all the way down to us, and we follow our orders to the T. I mean, being in the SEAL teams, we're outside of the box thinkers. Um, I mean, we're not idiots. Most SEALs have their degrees and a lot of them have their masters. And we've been in this game for a very, very long time. So the thing that we ask, when, and not out loud, we just hope and pray that the American public has enough trust and, and faith in us to do and make the right decision. I've seen so many, and I've heard so many Monday morning quarterbacks that are just it's the funniest thing to me because uh, I read stuff not not too much online, but this you know you hear people like oh I'd have killed him just did right there and there really I mean, would you I mean you've been there 
absolutely not. You hadn't been there. And then the other people are just like, well, you know, I'm, you know, you turned them loose, and and that was the right thing to do, even though everybody everybody died. So, how do you weigh human life? It's 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 a conundrum that can never be answered. It's 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 war, war and, and there is no right or wrong answer in in combat. And those people who aren't out there carrying the rifle have no business dictating what and how we do it. If oh. you want, if you want to know that. And don't, and don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not up no, here trying exactly to preach or anything like that. I'm just saying that if, if you, if you want to know the details about this and you want to make those command decisions, then grab a rifle and come help us. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, wake up every morning, kiss your wife or your husband, and live your life. And, and enjoy the freedoms that, that the American military provide for you. That's why we're out there. And we don't want to thank you, a pat on the back, or anything like that. We just want you to enjoy your life, and because everybody's made different. I mean, you got guys who are doctors and lawyers and accountants, and you have the war fighters, the guys who know how to fight, and we're good at it, and we love what we do, and we know how to make those decisions. So stay out of our way, and we'll stay out of yours. <laughs> Taylor, did you get to know the family of Mike Murphy? Did you spend any time with the family? Yeah, I will say, um, I will say, I, I got to meet his, his father, Dan, and he was incredibly gracious and excited for me to play. And obviously, you're everything under the sun, really, before I got to meet him. It was a week before we hit camera. And um, no, it's, I mean, as you can, you know, you're. You're breathing life into someone that's given his, you know. So when you're speaking to his family and his best friends and teammates, it's it's heavy-hearted. So it's it was a really, really more or less for me a sigh of relief when he was just like, "I'm grateful you get you're you're doing it, kick ass," mm -hmm. and um, that was a really big day for me. Mm -hmm. Peter, you had a recently had a screening for the families. Uh, that must have been uh, uh, an immensely emotional day. That was very emotional. Um, we had uh, the, the uh, Dietzes, Axelsons, Christiansons, and the Pattons were the first group of families to see the film uh, uh, as a whole, uh, as a group. And uh, it was, um, as you might imagine, quite intense. Mm -hmm. Marcus, I think one of the one of the many horrendously, you know, heart gripping moments in this film is when that, you know, you're lying on on your back there and the helicopter goes down. Uh, can you tell me about that moment in real life? Uh, yes, ma'am. In real life, I was unaware of that. I didn't know that that had happened. I was it was after well towards the end of the gunfight, and I, I had already crawled into the um, into a crevice and buried myself. Um, I'm, I just remember laying there praying. There was actually a helicopter that I, uh, I, was a, I believe it was an Apache that flew overhead. And I, I could see the pilot in the cockpit and, I, and the, the militia and everybody were walking over the top of me. I mean, I could, there was rocks falling on my head. I mean, I could, I could smell them. They were right over the top of me. And I had this idea. I couldn't key up my radio. Was, my battery was low and it was making this, there's a low battery ping that, that comes out once that happens and it, to give away my position. So every, I'd have to turn it off. And I, the thought actually crossed my mind to take a shot at the helicopter. Then I figured, well, that'd probably be a bad idea because if you turn around, you know, piss him off and come in here with guns blazing. Uh, but all of a sudden, while I was there, I was praying. I was like, God, please, uh, you know, give me something because I was paralyzed from the waist down. In the movie, they had me walking around. I, I didn't walk. I, I crawled for over seven miles that first night, uh, and then um, and was uh, shot again. Well, while I was laying there praying, it started to rain, and I thought, and then I remember going, "That's not really what I was asking for, God," because. <laughs> You, you can ask any frog man, even though our job demands us to be wet and sandy and miserable, we really don't like to be wet and sandy and miserable. So uh, all of a sudden, all the militia left. They kind of just started pushing up the backside of the mountain, and I had no idea what, it, what had gone down. And then um, two days later, when I got rest, when I, the villagers brought me in there, 
I was in this room. I was, they had already taken my clothes off of me. They, they stopped my bleeding as best they could, bandaged me up, and started to pull that frag out, and then they had left. And then about an hour later, the door kicked open and the Taliban flooded the room. And that's when they, the Taliban had me. And that's when I found out that the Hilo had been shot down and they were trying to tell me how many bodies were there and this and the I didn't believe it at first. I mean, that's how loud it was on our side of the, the mountain that I couldn't hear a helicopter getting blown out of the sky and rolled down uh, the hill. So that's, that's when I found out um, a few days later from the Taliban. And tell me about Golub, the man who, who rescued you. Um, it's just such an extraordinary twist in the whole story that in the end you were saved by an Afghan. And I know that you stay in touch with him now, do you not? He's here. He's here? He's here. He's at the hotel right now. <laughs> uh, um, he's a very humble man. And obviously, in, right after the, uh, the, sit the, the op went down and I was rescued, they, and they pulled him away from me. We, he left in the helicopter with me in real life. And uh, the rescue was at night, under gunfire. And when we loaded up in the helo, it's funny, one of the, the, the guys who rescued me, one of the PJs, he's out in the audience right now, he's a, a, a heart surgeon, he, uh, he almost shot me in the chest because I was dressed up like an Afghani and I had a rifle and Gulag was with me and they were having to carry me. Well, I, the only thing that saved me, because I came up at the back side, the wrong side of the helo and the helo actually came in to crack. The rescue is, is crazier than anything you just saw on that, on that TV. Um, the Air Force came in to get me out of there. It was absolutely insane. Well, I had come up on the wrong side of the helo, and all of a sudden there was lasers on my chest. And luckily, I had the, uh, I had fallen. I was a lot heavier back then, and I, I fell. And the guy behind me was a Green Beret, and he had a, a American flag glint tape on his chest, and it pinged. And that's the reason um, he dropped his weapon and didn't shoot me. And then they load Gulab and I up in the helo. We banked off the mountain. They took us to, where'd they take us, bro? Uh, Abad or Jabad? Jabad. Jabad. And then they pulled, um, pulled him away from me. Which was a big deal. I, 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 he, he was scared to death to be in that helo. It went from one of those things where he had been protecting me for five days, and when we got into that helo, he was wrapped around my leg like a, like a wet cat, you know, and I was just, just kind of. And then when they jerked him away from me, I didn't have enough strength to figure out what was going on, and he pulled me back into the helo, and when they shut the door, I just remember them pulling him away, and then we flew to another base where they offloaded me onto another transport, flew me to Bagram Air Force Base. And I, uh, I was in the hospital and had multiple surgeries to, to put myself back together for about a, uh, almost a year. And then we, I redeployed to Iraq in 06 and 07. And, um, and redeployed? Yes, ma'am. And um, I didn't know that. It, wasn't, it wasn't a real popular idea in the community, but... Uh, <laughs> Luckily, some of the headshed um, Admiral Olson and some of the other um, admirals gave me the blessing. All, all I wanted to do was go back. I mean, that's what I was born to do. And uh, it's not that I, I, I'm messed up mentally or anything like that, but they took something from me. They, they, they beat me. And when you beat a seal, you, you better kill us. Because if you don't, when we heal up, we're going to come back after you. And the only place I knew to go... I had to go back, and I, I went back into uh, Ramadi, Iraq, Al Anbar Province in 06, 07, which was pretty much the worst place on the planet. And I, uh, I got my knees blown out on a raid we were doing, and my, my spine fractured again, and I, it cost me my career. So after I had gotten, after I was discharged, I remember that was the hardest thing that I had ever had to face in my entire life. Not budge training, not uh, all the injuries or anything like that. The day they told me I, I couldn't be a SEAL. And, uh, and I was beating my head against the wall for a few years. Luckily, my wife found me. But um, I finally got in touch with Gulab. To get back to your question, I kind of got off tangent a little bit. Uh, I, a lot of my buddies that were still going back over there were keeping tabs on him. And I could communicate with him as much as I possibly could. And 
um, our community and the, and, uh, the military, we did as much as we possibly could for their village. I mean, it's in the hornet's nest. So we, we would build, send money to build a school, the Taliban would, would burn it down. We, uh, we built a road in, into, their, uh, into their village so they could have easier access into uh, some of the major cities. But uh, overall, I got Gulab back over here just uh, to visit so I could see him again. He doesn't, I, I've tried and tried, and I'm like, hey, come here. I mean, nobody deserves to have American citizenship more than, than you. you. You fought for America, and you're not even an American. I mean, you saved my life. And uh, he's, he's such a proud Afghani, he doesn't want anything. He, he wants to stay in Afghanistan, and then you know, every now and again, come over here and see me. And it's funny. Uh, the first time I picked him up, he was telling the story. He had been, sh after uh, I had left, obviously the Taliban and everybody over there are, are always trying to kill him. So they had, they had burned his house down, they've killed multiple members of his family, they blew his car up, and he had been shot a few months before he came to see me. And then when I picked him up from the airport, and we were driving down the road, and we had to have an, he doesn't speak English, and my posture is, is very limited. And he goes, you know, my first uh, plan of uh, when I got here is I was going to burn your house down, blow your car up, and shoot you in the hip. <laughs> and uh, story, story. Well, Peter, um, making this movie, you know, obviously it's it's a very tough movie. Did you have any? Uh, I mean, did you have a lot of problems getting it onto the screen? I mean, you know, this morning we heard from Jerry Bruckheimer how difficult it was for him to get uh, Black Hawk down, in a sense, through the kind of feel-good culture of, of what America wants mm -hmm. to see. We're a war, a war-tired country. Did you have it have difficulties getting the movie done? Um, yeah, all movies are difficult. Uh, uh, Middle Eastern war films are, are notoriously difficult. Uh, we were lucky um, to have. Uh, uh, s such an overwhelmingly inspiring story that um, w was almost undeniable in, in terms of its ability to inspire and uh, touch, touch one's heart that um, we were able to, when financing was tight, we were able to find uh, 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 independent producers. There's a gentleman, Randall Emmett, here tonight who, who stepped up uh, um, and kind of partnered with Ron Meyer and his crew. And Ron, being an ex-Marine, was, was very inclined to lend a universal support. But, but you know, it's, it's risky to go into this terrain as a, as a, from a business perspective. So it took, a, it took a bit of a village to, to pull it off, but um, uh, the power of Marcus's story, um, uh, the power of Gulab and, and that, that, that unique relationship between an American and an Afghan, uh, and I think uh, the spirit of all the men who, who lost their lives just kept winning and was undeniable. I, I was uh, certainly not gonna be dissuaded and, and you know, fortunately, we're able to put it, pull it together. But it, you know, it wasn't it wasn't as easy as like you know, Batman. We didn't have Batman. <laughs> you we have had Marcus. Yeah, Mar you definitely had Marcus. Taylor, just you know, obviously, this is a movie about the bond between these men. Did you did you have to did, did you and the other actors you know playing these incredible comrades in arms? I mean, did you did you work on that on bonding? Uh, it really wasn't a lot of work. We got. We still get along, and we're very close. And, and Ben, Mark, and uh, Emil, um, we're still very tight. And it was just—I mean, this is something that's just bigger than all of us. So, um, just first day on. Where did we, you shoot we, it? Where was it shot? Uh, Santa Fe, mountains of Santa Fe, and then in Albuquerque. And um, we got there quite early and trained together, ate together, woke up together. It was, uh, and we loved it. I mean, we were very spoiled to be a part of it, but what we came out with was, uh, you know, incredible friendships for life. I could probably answer that question yeah. better. I, you know, when we got a hold of them, it was, um, what? Yeah, the SEALs came out there and, <laughs> and uh, well, we're thinking, hey, you know, we have Hollywood actors, you, yay. But, um, <laughs> We, Don't support that. We got we got on, on set and we met him um, a month a month before shooting, and hammered him. I mean, as soon as they got jocked up with all their gear and everything like that, from sun up to sundown, we were we were hammering them and we didn't cut them any slack. I mean, they were they were bleeding every day. 
and you can actually watch, I mean, that's how friendship, true friendship and true teamwork is, is forged through um, pain and blood and sweat and tears. And, and they did that. And they, they, not one time did they complain about it. I mean, they, they realized why they were out there and who, and who they were representing. And it was, it was really something to watch them come together as a, as a team. And, and through, even through the movie, it never stopped. I mean, they, and every day, sun up, sun down, we were always together uh, with them and, and they were together. And like he said, they're still friends um, today. I mean, if, if it came down to it, the training that we gave, gave these guys, I mean, I could throw Taylor a rifle right now and he could very much handle himself. <laughs> One last question to you, Marcus, obviously. You'll see, you've just sat through this movie now tonight and you've lived again you know, it's obviously a, there are changes, of course, as you said, from the reality to what actually happened. But still, you've lived through this intensity again tonight. What does it make you feel looking at the movie tonight, as a, as a, you, as when you're thinking about that experience and seeing it on the screen? Oh, I just think that uh, Pete and and Taylor and Mill and Mark and and Ben and the ca rest of the cast and the crew they did an absolutely outstanding job of, of taking what happened on the mountain that day and and putting it into a film I mean even writing the book I couldn't put every detail that ever happened on the mountain that day down on paper because I just simply can't remember it uh, I, but to really answer your question is as I live what through that every day in my head from the time I I lay down in bed through the night, up in the morning. There's not a, a moment that goes by that, that I don't think about it. And one of my curses is the fact that um, every time you hear about Operation Red Wing or Lone Survivor or anything like that, my name is synonymous with that, that event. And anytime anybody ever walks up to me, all they ever want to do is talk about it. Nobody ever wants to talk to me about football or hunting or, or anything like that. They just want to talk to me about the worst week of my life. And so it's, it's always with me, and that's the reason I, I stick to the friends that I've had since I was 10 years old, and some of the guys, uh, I mean, Taylor and I are really close now. Pete and I, I've been real close with him for, for many years now because they understand it, and they, they've actually been through it with me now. But to see it on screen, it, it's just one of those things when I, I, I was like, hey, you missed something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It may look like it was miserable on, on that TV right there, but I can tell you it was twice as bad in real life. I know. So I, I just wish that, um, I always wish that some of my teammates would have, would have made it out as well to get their, their side of the story as, and to make this thing, to, to, to really open it up and, and, and find out just everything that happened because my, like I said, it's coming for me, and I don't remember everything. I couldn't possibly put, put it all down. All right, well, listen, we have been so incredibly honored to have you with us tonight. This is a great movie. I want to really congratulate Peter Berg for this amazing creative Thank feat. Thank you. And, of course, Taylor for his magnificent portrayal of Mike Murphy. And to hear, we, we've all got so much more we want to talk to Marcus Luttrell about. I'd like just to say as well how much we want to honor his, his dead colleague, his dead teammates who you know, we are all thinking about. When those pictures come up at the end, it is the most moving moment in the, in the movie, actually. So thank you so much, all of you, for being here. Thank you all for being here, too. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you, everybody in the audience. <laughs>